These men are Bijagos, members of an ethnic group from Guinea-Bissau in Western Africa. They begin their initiation at the age of 12. During the two weeks before leaving for the forest to accomplish the final steps towards making them respected men, they dance every evening. To overcome the terrible ordeals that await them, they rely on the energy which the shark dance gives them. The shark is the incarnation of wildness, strength, aggression, and sexual potency. By imitating him, the men learn to control and to channel the raw animal energy inside themselves. Here, the shark is neither good nor evil, but simply a force of nature. How is he looked upon elsewhere? What place does this magnificent predator occupy in man's imagination? This is what we are going to discover on a journey that will take us from the Orient to the Occident, through legends, religious beliefs, and myths. But first, where did the shark come from? When and how did man first come into contact with him? The evolution of sharks began 400 million years ago. We can distinguish two important periods. The initial period was during the first era, between 400 and 200 million years ago. We have groups of armored fish called placoderms, which were probably the ancestors of the shark. During this first era, we can recognize sharks by their teeth, their ventricles, and their spiked bodies. The second period was during the second era. First, placoderms disappeared and sharks diversified. In the middle of this era, which we call Jurassic, the age of dinosaurs, we see almost all forms of sharks as we know them today. So we can say that when man appeared three million years ago, Lucy could have been familiar with all forms of existent sharks, such as the great white shark, the mako, the sand tiger shark, and of course the famous megalodon, which disappeared about a million years ago, and who left us these gigantic teeth. The megalodon was the size of a whale shark, with the aggressive nature of its contemporary cousin, the great white shark. He was a true Tyrannosaurus of the sea, whose favorite prey was the whale. Fortunately, he disappeared before Lucy's descendants learned how to swim. We don't know when or how the first significant encounters between man and shark took place, although we suppose there were something like these images. Archaeological sites have revealed that at least 40,000 years ago, man, in search of food, realized the importance of fish, and before he developed specific fishing techniques, used the only techniques he knew, the ones he used for hunting. Armed probably with a pointed wooden stake, he would hunt for fish at the water's edge. Later, after becoming an underwater hunter, man and the shark became competitors, with the shark fighting hard to steal his opponent's prey. Archaeological finds indicate that these initial encounters which sometimes led to confrontation, took place in a very auspicious area, the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean, where the relief, often of volcanic or coral origin, formed shallow, warm-water lagoons. 
Man still lives there in close symbiosis with the sea, since in these regions, the marine animal biodiversity is greater than that of land animals, and thus a primary resource. These Pacific paradise-like islands were totally colonized in the space of 30,000 years. Two main oceanic cultures developed, the Polynesian and the Melanesian. What were the beliefs of these men and women who sailed thousands of kilometers going from island to island? How did they imagine the world? What was man's place in the scheme of things? What was the animal's place, and among them, the great predator, the shark? Before being converted to Christianity, which we estimate at about the mid-18th century, oceanic people were polytheistic. In addition, their relationship with nature was such that they considered the elements in nature as possessing the same characteristics as man. Therefore, exchanges between man and nature were extremely important. These ocean-dwelling societies lived in almost total harmony with the sea and felt there was practically no break between island and ocean or earth and sea. And in this world in which earth and sea were one, the shark was a sort of king. The peoples of the Pacific are the only ones to have turned the shark into a true symbol. In their oral tradition societies, mythology still plays a role on the spirits and influences people's behavior, practices, and symbols. In spite of modernization, certain attitudes regarding nature and more particularly the shark have been either openly perpetuated or hidden under a cloud of Christianity going back only two or three centuries. In the Salomon Island village of Laulasi, when someone dies, his body is offered to the sharks. Only the head is conserved in small bamboo traps. By talking to the shark, we speak to our ancestors, whose spirit lives on in the animal's body. It's these same ancestors who ask the living to dance and to offer sacrifices in honor of Bakwa, the shark god, since he has the power to make fishing abundant and to prevent shark attacks. This pig is about to be sacrificed. A few generations ago, before the intervention of missionaries, the sacrifices were human. The women sing, imploring Bakwa to protect their husbands and their children. People spend several hours a day here in shark-infested waters, and they claim that no one has ever been attacked, except for one man who didn't believe in Bakwa's power. A little later, the pig's entrails are offered to the sharks. According to the Laulasi, if Bakwa accepts the offering, this shark will be the first to eat. If the small black spotted sharks take the food first, it is considered a bad omen, signifying that Bakwa has not listened to the men's prayers. In the end, however, the sacred shark takes the sacrifice. And 
the other sharks will only share what's left over. The entire village sings and dances for joy. Once again, the natural order has been respected. Not very far north, at Kantu, in Papua New Guinea, the shark is the central figure of a magical and sacred ritual. The shark callers, as the men call themselves, prove their courage and their strength by capturing the animal. They call him by stirring up the water with a noisemaker made of coconuts woven together on a vine. They capture the shark with a slipknot and a wooden floater carved in the form of a propeller. Moreau tells the men to summon the sharks with magic. He has also given men the power to communicate with their ancestors. It all began with Moroa. In the beginning, he created the shark. And then later, he created man and gave him these powers. But the first shark was caught by Moroa. It was Moroa? Yes. At dawn, he went to sea in his boat. He shook the coconuts, and the shark appeared. His magic had worked. It was the same magic we use today. By Moroa, you mean God? The Christian church and the government call him God. But in our language, he is Moroa. Moroa also insisted that man not have sexual relations or eat land animals before leaving to capture the shark. When going out to sea, one must make a complete break with the land. If a fisherman transgresses this law, he will fail. His magic will not work. Although men fish for him, the shark remains a king and is treated accordingly. The slipknot is described as a floral wreath, and the floater a pillow for the animal to rest his head.
And he talk, suppose me play walk him, pass him block us then, but speed block man, you know, him life forever. Now they tell us that if we continue our traditional way of life, we will not go to heaven. But we, the village chiefs, cannot believe that. If we live as we have always lived, our spirit will certainly be with God. And if we don't, it will not. When I am dead and buried, if I have not followed our traditions, God will reject me. They are destroying our customs, and we don't know why. We search for reasons for them being against our traditions, but we cannot find any. Why are they against them? Monotheistic religions don't like these customs because magic is attributed to satanic practices and governments consider them primitive. On Tana, a small island south of Vanuatu, all the men with traditional names consider themselves as magicians. They are trees whose roots are sacred. Their powers come from magic stones. Ocean-dwelling clans possess stones which have control over sea creatures such as the turtle, a sacred animal, which is eaten as a ritual and enables the exchange of magic powers. These exchanges are possible thanks to the shark, who permits man to capture him. As for the turtle, we speak to the shark by addressing his spirit, which lives in the stone. In the secret area where the stones exercise their power, the old village chief passes his knowledge down to his son, who must succeed him as the stone magician. This year, it is you who will go to the men of the land and trade the turtle for a pig. But first, you must know the magic of the stones. The black stone is the sharks and the white, the turtles. To attract the turtle into the bay, you must turn the white stone towards the earth. Place the black stone of the shark behind and don't forget the pilot fish. This way the sharks will frighten the turtle and push it towards the shore where you can catch it. If you succeed, it means that the stones have accepted you and that you will become a magician. The next day, the chief's son goes around the bay looking for the precious turtle. Will he succeed? Will he too become a magician? The old chief is happy. Thanks to the shark spirit's kindness, his son has succeeded. Now the young man has to walk towards the interior of the land, through the mountains, to the village of Yakel, also called the village of customs, because the people who live there have maintained their ancestral way of life. 
His journey includes a dangerous area, the Yasur volcano. From its entrails at the beginning of time, the god Hunyin spewed out some errant, talkative, and disobedient stones. The earth was born as a result of their wanderings. All this movement, however, tired the stones out. One day, they stopped moving, and out of chaos came peace. Today, the stones no longer speak, but at sunset, they come to life again. Evil and wandering spirits come out and attack men who have not gone home. The men of the sea arrive at the home of the men from the land. The trading of a turtle for a pig is a very important ritual. It renews the alliance between the two clans. Exchanging these prestigious animals and then eating them signifies that the mana, or secret power of the groups living at the waterside, leaves for the mountains, and at the same time, the power of the manbus comes down to the sea. Koran lives in Ambrim, another of Vanuatu's 40 islands. He's recently installed a winch on his traditional boat, which enables him to fish for snapper, a handsome red fish that lives in very deep water. For a while now, Koran has had problems with sharks. They eat all his fish before he can raise them to the surface. For him, there is only one explanation. Someone or something has put a magic spell on him. He has to consult the sorcerers who live in the interior of the island. Ambrim is a mysterious island, known for its very powerful and easily offended sorcerers. Tofor is the most powerful and the most feared. It takes courage for Koran to seek advice from him, since Tofor is not from his village. And his advice, like a trial sentence, has to be followed to the letter. <laughs> Your way of fishing is new, and the Yarima spirits don't like it. Your reel takes you too far into their space. The sharks that eat your fish are merely the instruments of discontented spirits. In the past, when enemies were about to destroy our clan, the sorcerers combined all their power and carved a breadfruit tree in the shape of a shark. They slid inside it, and the trunk came to life. It became a shark and devoured all our enemies. If the sharks are against you today, it's because you have committed an error. You did not think about whether the spirits would let you fish or not. You must ask for their forgiveness. You must make a ceremony and sacrifice a pig. That is the custom.
On Bora Bora, one of the most touristic of Polynesian atolls, men like Teoira like to tell this story. Taoroa, the Polynesian god who created the world, had a beautiful blue shark. The men would swim with him and even let their children climb onto his back. One day, the men got it into their heads that the shark was evil, and they decided to kill him. Two brave brothers were assigned the job. Once they had pierced his head with a spear, Taharoa became furious and reappeared, bringing his beautiful blue shark back to life. Ever since, fearing the wrath of Taharoa, the men respect the shark. Although the shark has become a profitable attraction here, the men have not forgotten the place he occupies in their culture. Teoira recalls that in the past, the shark, by carrying the spirits of the dead, enabled them to become ancestors. Teoira only fishes for sharks when it's absolutely necessary, and occasionally likes to repeat the movements his ancestors used to capture them. Hurry! 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 Hurry!